Good afternoon, everyone. The topic of session three today is challenges and successful cases for oral PPK. This session has two speakers. The first speaker, Dr. Rodrigo Cristofoliti, is assistant professor at the Center for Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology at the University of Florida. Dr. Christofelity's lab focuses on translational research integrating molecular pharmaceutics, biorelevant in vitro tools like multi-stage dissolution and the microphysiological systems, and the pathophysiology-based modeling to assess interpatient variability in pharmacokinetics. The second speaker, Dr. Yusuf Moza, is a staff fellow at the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards, OGD. Dr. Moza has experiences in oral PPK modeling and he is a scientific reviewer in the oral PPK group in DQMM. After the two presentations, there will be a panel discussion. The moderators for the panel discussion are Dr. Lucy Fang and Dr. Filippos Kessisglou. Dr. Fang is the Deputy Director of the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards, OGD. Dr. Fang is an established expert at FDA in the use of quantitative clinical pharmacology approaches in the review and the regulation of generic drugs. Dr. K. Sisglu is a distinguished scientist at Merck, leading the biopharmaceuticals team and overseeing the translational biopharmaceuticals efforts in the pharmaceutical sciences department. Dr. K. Sisglu has more than 15 years of experiences in the fields of biopharmaceutics and formulation development, pharmacokinetics, PBPK and IV IVAC modeling as related to clinical drug development and CMC regulatory applications. Let's turn our attention to the presentations. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Feng Wu for the very kind introduction and also the organizing committee for an invitation to join this meeting. My talk today will be about integrating biopharmaceutic data and gastrointestinal physiology using mechanistic modeling. The use of modeling approaches has allowed scientists to derive fundamental parameters from in vitro data. This, in turn, has led to the design of more complex in vitro experiments allowing these parameters to be defined more precisely. This has been a step forward in understanding these experiments and the data they produced, and consequently improving the quality of PBPK models. For example, mechanistic modeling of in vitro data generated from metabolic enzyme systems like hepatocytes, liver microsomes, or recombinant enzymes is rather useful to quantify enzyme kinetics, which is needed to predict hepatic metabolic clearance in PBPK modeling. Also, model-based analysis of in vitro data collected from overexpressing cell lines is also important to characterize transporter-mediated kinetics and inform permeability-limited tissue distribution in PBPK modeling. A similar concept can be applied to solubility, dissolution, and precipitation experiments, where mechanistic modeling can be used to estimate intrinsic parameters required for simulating oral absorption. However, the challenge here is to navigate through the multiplicity of available tools. Overall, the core idea that we have here is to disassemble in vitro data, moving from processes to parameters, followed by subsequent convolution of parameters back into processes, using PPPK modeling to predict and define population variability in drug absorption, distribution, and elimination. 
I will try to illustrate this approach using two case studies. For the first example, we have ibuprofen as the model drug. Ibuprofen is a highly permeable but poorly soluble weak acid. Here, we applied a reverse translation strategy to identify a biopredictive dissolution method for ibuprofen. So, we started with available clinical data from crossover PK studies. As you can see, ibuprofen sodium, which is represented by the circles in this plot, is absorbed significantly faster than a standard formulation containing ibuprofen free acid. Both formulations are bioequivalent for the extent of exposure for AUC, but they are bioequivalent for CMAX. So it seems the residence time in the small intestine is enough to ensure complete dissolution, but in vivo dissolution rates differ significantly between both formulations. However, in vitro dissolution of both formulations in 50 millimolars of phosphate buffer at pH 6.8, which is the compendial recommendation for quality control tests, failed to discriminate between the formulations, since both formulations dissolved very rapidly. In this research, we revisited the modeling work by Mooney and co-workers on the dissolution kinetics of carboxylic acids. And we hypothesized that the higher buffer concentration in the QC method was catalyzing ibuprofen dissolution on a non-physiological way. So, using the Mooney model, we estimated a concentration of phosphate buffer that would simulate the microclimate in the diffusion layer of ibuprofen dissolving in bicarbonate buffer, which is the physiological buffer. As a result, we observed that ibuprofen sodium dissolution was insensitive to buffer concentration. On the other hand, in case of ibuprofen free acid, the smaller the buffer concentration, the slower the dissolution rate is. As the next step, we analyzed the in vitro data using a diffusion layer model available in SIVA and Sensig, accounting for drug solubility at the solid liquid interface of dissolving particles. By fitting this diffusion layer model to in vitro dissolution data, we estimated an empirical product-specific particle size distribution, relating the specific formulation to its dissolution profile. Even though this process may be hindered by issues of parameter identifiability, this can be mitigated by simultaneous fit across independent experiments under different experimental conditions. And this is illustrated in the plot on the right-hand side of this slide. With the same uh, product-specific particle size distribution, we were able to recapitulate the in vitro data under different experimental conditions, namely 50 and 5 millimolars of phosphate buffer. The same mechanistic framework was used for simulating in vivo dissolution. So basically, we used the same diffusion layer model in the PBPK simulator in order to integrate the product-specific particle size distribution with drug solubility estimated considering gastrointestinal physiology in order to simulate individual in vivo dissolution profiles throughout the gastrointestinal tract. So, briefly, in, in, in the previous slide, we disassembled the in vitro dissolution into fundamental parameters. Now, we are reassembling the dissolution process in vivo 
considering the gastrointestinal physiology and variability. And for this modeling exercise, we used the SENSIP simulator. So the performance of this integrated modeling approach was assessed by comparing simulated in vivo dissolution with in vivo dissolution deconvoluted from PK data. Overall, this stepwise modeling workflow allowed us to reproduce available clinical data for both model formulations, ibuprofen sodium and ibuprofen free acid. As the next step in this research, we applied this integrated IV IVE PBPK modeling approach to assess the risks of failing bioequivalence criteria. And here, we are using additional positive and negative controls. In other words, we simulated 10 virtual bioequivalence trials for a bioequivalent generic TBE and also 10 virtual bioequivalence trials for a test formulation that failed to meet bioequivalence criteria, the TMBE. So here we applied a simplified empirical approach. So the physiology of virtual subjects was kept constant in both occasions. We call these fixed subjects. And a clinically obtained within subject variability coefficient was assigned to BE metrics on a post hoc basis. Even though this is a very practical approach, this empirical approach assumes that the within subject variability is similar for test and reference formulations, which might not be always the case. And in our research, even though the simulated bioequivalence trials captured the direction of the in vivo BE results, which is oriented towards the upper limit of the acceptance criteria, the result for the negative control was only borderline and could have led to false, false positive conclusions. So here, if we use the between subject variability as a surrogate for the within subject variability, we would conclude that the assumption of similar variability between test and reference formulations is no longer valid for this scenario. Therefore, mechanistic modeling of within subject variability rather than empirical post hoc assignment may be necessary to allow us to capture this formulation physiology interaction and more research is needed in this field. In the second example, we have ketoconazole as the model drug. Ketoconazole is a highly permeable but poorly soluble weak base that precipitates in the intestinal lumen after gastric emptying into a less favorable pH conditions. Different in vitro methods have been proposed to predict precipitation kinetics. For this study case, we modeled reported in vitro precipitation data for ketoconazole generated using three different in vitro systems. Model-based analysis of in vitro data was done in DDD+, using the built-in mechanistic models for membrane and biphasic dissolution to derive first-order precipitation rates. In other words, for membrane and biphasic dissolution, we fitted donor and receptor or aqueous and organic compartments simultaneously to derive mean precipitation times. The faster precipitation rate was obtained from the dumping test, and the slowest one was derived from the biphasic dissolution. The mean precipitation times obtained from each in vitro systems 
were inputted into gastroplus to simulate systemic exposure of ketoconazole 200 mg administered as an oral solution under fasting conditions. Other two simulations were carried out uh, assuming no precipitation in the intestinal lumen or using a mean precipitation time fitted to available intraluminal data for ketoconazole 100 and 300 milligrams. The PK profile of ketoconazole solution was better recapitulated when using precipitation kinetics derived from in vivo data. Biphasic dissolution, represented in green, seems rather promising to estimate precipitation kinetics of weak bases like ketoconazole. But on the other hand, dumping test and transmembrane flux overestimated the precipitated fraction and consequently underestimated the systemic exposure of ketoconazole. A similar result was observed when simulating systemic exposure of ketoconazole 400 mg oral solution. However, ketoconazole precipitation kinetics seems to be dose dependent. And after simulating oral administration of 800 mg of ketoconazole solution, the oral, PBPK, the oral PK profile was better reproduced when using a faster precipitation rate. So, I'd like to end this presentation highlighting three major points. The first, model-based analysis of in vitro data is helpful to derive fundamental input parameters for PBPK models. However, navigating between different in vitro models might be challenging. Generalization of first-order precipitation rate across different doses may not be straightforward. And last but not least, further research is needed to optimize propagation of within subject variability through simulations, allowing us to capture the interaction between drug and formulation parameters with the interoccasion variability in physiology. Looking forward to having stimulating discussions during the panel. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, this is the second talk in the session Challenges and Successful Cases for Oral BBBK. The topic of my talk is modeling for success, a case example for a certain rear phosphate. This is my disclaimer. The objectives of this talk are the following. First, to describe the challenges in developing a BBBK model in pediatrics and to describe a BBBK model for oseltamivir phosphate and its metabolite in both adults and pediatric, to establish the solution safe space using virtual bioequivalence simulations. There are several challenges associated with developing BBBK model in pediatrics. These challenges can be listed under four categories. First, model development. Generally, a BBBK model depends on the confidence of assumed processes. Further, there is no general guidance to choose appropriate variability to represent real scenario in clinical trials. Also, simulations can carry intrinsic errors from reality. Second, scaling. Allometric scaling accounts for changes in body size and scaling from in vitro and preclinical in vivo data to human may carry several limitations. Third, age-dependent changes. The changes in several gastrointestinal physiologies, such as BH, transient time, and few others may impact the solubility and the solution of a drug product. Fourth, model application. Sometimes in vivo pharmacokinetic data are not available for model verification. In addition, there is limited application of BBBK modeling 
in pediatric for regulatory filing. This slide shows the general approach for developing a BBBK model. It starts with developing the model in adults by leveraging all kinds of data as model inputs, followed by model refinement, evaluation, and validation. The adults model can be extrapolated to pediatric model using age-specific system parameters and clearance scaling. In regulatory submissions, the applicant's BBBQ model can be generally used to assess the solution, solubility, excipients, and particle size distribution. This can be conducted by virtual bioequivalence simulations between test and reference products with crossover population and incorporated variability. Today, I am going to present a case example to determine bioequivalence dissolution safe space for oseltamavir phosphate. Oseltamavir phosphate is used for influenza type A and type B. It is metabolized by carboxyl esterase 1 to oseltamavir carboxylate. This table shows the parameters used in model development. We incorporated age-dependent human hepatic carboxylesterase 1 postnatal ontogeny. In addition, we included in vitro dissolution data and in vivo pharmacokinetic data from different dosage forms at different strength for model development and validation. This model was used to conduct virtual bioequivalence simulations to determine the solution safe space for oseltamavir phosphates in adults and pediatrics. Gastroblast with BBBK plus module was used for modeling and simulation. First, intravenous oseltamavir phosphate and its metabolite oseltamavir carboxylate were used to set up the clearance and distribution parameters by fitting the BBBK model to the observed plasma concentration profiles for oseltamavir phosphate and its metabolite. The absorption of oseltamavir phosphate 75 mg from capsule formulation was predicted well by the model, as you can see from this population simulation. The ACAT module in gastroblast was used to evaluate the oral exposure predictions. The model was also validated using oseltamavir 100 mg and 150 mg from capsule formulation as you can see from fitting the plasma concentration profiles for oseltamavir phosphate and oseltamavir carboxylate. The pediatric BBBK model was developed from the adult BBBK model by changing the physiological parameters predicted using population estimates of age-related physiology and ACAT module in gastroblast. In addition, age-dependent human Hepatic carboxyl esterase 1 postnatal ontogeny was included as I mentioned before. The pediatric model successfully predicted the plasma concentration of oseltamavir phosphate and oseltamavir carboxylate after giving oseltamavir phosphate for different age groups 0 to 2 months, 3 to 9 months, 1 to 5 years, and 9 to 18 years. After model development and validation, it was used to determine bioequivalent dissolution safe space for oseltamavir phosphate using virtual bioequivalence simulations. Here we change the percentage of release for the reference formulation to different extents to generate the release profile for the hypothetical test formulation. Then, Crossover virtual bioequivalence simulations using default variability in gastroblast were conducted, followed by bioequivalence assessment between the reference and the hypothetical test formulation. As an example, you can see that decreasing the percentage of release for the reference formulation by more than 10% would not maintain bioequivalence between the reference and hypothetical test product. This approach can be used to support critical quality attributes, such as the solution, for different orally administered drug products, 
and to help in decision making in accepting the solution limits and mitigating the risk for non bioequivalent products. In conclusion, a well developed and validated BBBK model is pivotal for effective application. However, there are several challenges associated with developing a BBBK model and its extrapolation. This approach can be used to aid regulatory decision making and to support generic drug development. For example, in the solution safe space determination, product quality, particle size distribution, virtual simulations, and many others. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the constructive feedback from my division management, Dr. Liang Zhao and Dr. Lucy Fang. I also want to thank Dr. Fang Wu and Dr. Lei Miao and our colleagues from the Office of Pharmaceutical Equality, Dr. Paul and Dr. Kimberly Rains, for their contribution and support. I also want to thank our office leadership, Dr. Robert Leuenberger and Dr. Lei Zhang for providing strategic vision to promote innovative approaches in generic drug development. Thank you. I think we're ready. I think we have all the presenters on camera. So hopefully you can all hear me. We're going to move now to the discussion panel. And uh, it is my pleasure to present, uh, to introduce you the panelists. Uh, Dr. Uh, Myung Jin Kim is the acting director of the Division of Therapeutic Performance 2 at the Office of Research and Standards in OGD. Dr. Kim has been leading the efforts to develop product specific guidances for solid oral dosage forms. She serves as the FDA deputy topic lead for the ICH expert working group on M13 bioequivalence for immediate release solid oral dosage forms. Dr. Jian Hong Fan is a senior staff fellow in the Division of Pharmacometrics, Office of Clinical Pharmacology. Dr. Feng has experience in oral PAPK modeling and is a scientific reviewer of PAPK submissions and research in the PBPK team. Dr. Barnu Zolnik is an acting biopharmaceutics team lead in the Office of New Drug Products in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Dr. Zolnik, his responsibilities include evaluating and reviewing biopharmaceutic section of the new drug applications and abbreviated drug applications. Dr. Tycho Heimbach has recently joined Merck in the biopharmaceutics and specialty dosage group, where he served as a biopharmaceutics expert in oral and parenteral drug development. Prior to that, 
Dr. Heimbach was at Novartis, where he led a global PPK modeling group in DMPK and served as a PPK and biopharmaceutics expert. Dr. Du Shinshan is a professor of pharmacy, professor of pharmaceutical sciences, and serves as a director of an kinetics core in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Michigan. Dr. Shan's research interests focus on direct measurement of drug dissolution in the human GI tract, drug discovery, and nanomedicine for cancer therapeutics and pharmacokinetics. Finally, Dr. Yu Chung Chan is a, is a chief scientific officer in biopharmaceutics and biostatistics and Apotex. Dr. Chang's main responsibilities are to provide pharmacokinetic and statistical advices in preparing protocol and study report for pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and clinical studies of complex drug and biosimilar products in the design of bioequivalence or clinical endpoint studies and the analysis of data for the development of traditional drug products. In addition, our two presenters, Dr. Yusuf Musa and Dr. Rodrigo Cristofoletti, will also join the panel. So with that, I'll turn you to Lucy for our first to kick off the panel discussion. Can you hear me okay? Good. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, I want to ask the first question on the case example that was presented by Dr. Yusuf uh, Musa. So, in the case example of the osipamilier phosphate, the PVP Morgan simulation was used to determine the bioequivalent dissolution state for both adults and pediatrics. The modeling includes interpolation or extrapolation of the formulation that, uh, that we actually do not have the dissolution or the clinical data. So I want to hear from you all that on the considerations when we extend this framework of strategy to other products with confidence. So can we go to Tycho first? Yes, uh, and you can hear me, right? So, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, this uh, also Tommy Rear phosphate example is exactly uh, the way to go with the science, looking at uh, formulation performance and bioequivalence modeling from adults all the way to neonates. Now, uh, because the question also relates to how this can be, or the, the knowledge we gained, how this can be applied to other products, uh, I think it's useful to dissect this question. Um, the, the first thing is, is that uh, Oseltamivir being an antiviral agent, there's lots of data available, right? And uh, particularly in the neonates, if you look across therapeutic areas, for example, in oncology, you may only have very, very few patients. Uh, so, uh, but if you look in malaria space and um, uh, again, antivirals, you have, see these types of data sets. So then the question becomes, do we uh, agree with this type of finding, right, which showed that there was bioequivalence with a 10% reduction in the dissolution profile for adults, but uh, for the lower age groups, the, um, the bioequivalence range was smaller. So the first thing, if if I had to redo this modeling, if I had to, if I were a literature reviewer, I would, if I would think about some uh, limitations uh, or things for improvement, would be that the dissolution profiles themselves uh, are uh, very reduced in the in the extent, but not in the time shifting. So I think it would be interesting to see if you were to change the dissolution profiles themselves, would you see the same type of results that you have found here? Then the second thing is that I do agree with the overall assessment for the for the uh, for the age groups, but I am always a little bit cautious when pediatric gets lumped together as one group, because um, as you split out neonates, neonates are entirely different, um, and th that means you needed to include the ontogeny, which is what you did. Uh, I think I think successfully, but since the question is, can we apply this to other drugs? You can only apply it to such a big age group range uh, if you know about the ontogeny of the drug. And I I can give you an example, right? Um, if you look at the uh, oncology drug nilotinib, where uh, 
uh, Novartis had published a paper where they had one formulation, but they wanted to figure out what is the dose that can be given to two to six year olds. Holds. There were only three three patients, right? So this is not suitable for bioequivalence testing. But the PBBK model, as you have described it here, could be could potentially be used to to sort of do some mechanistic modeling. So so in summary, I I do agree with the. The overall approach that it is done, I, I I don't know if the dissolution profiles were optimal, and I do not know if you had changed the variability if you would have different findings. So tackle. So anything additional, MJ? You have any additional thoughts? Um, thank you, Lucia, and thank you uh, for this opportunity to participate in. Very wonderful um, workshop. Uh, I actually learned very much uh, from yesterday and today's uh, discussions. Uh, although uh, Taiko is somewhat uh, critical of this uh, <laughs> pediatric uh, uh, work, uh, what I want to convey is that uh, I have to give a credit to the group uh, who have uh, worked on this project. And as you know, uh, when it comes to the pediatrics, it's uh, really challenging and it's a much needed area for the PBPK, for the uh, biocovalence and the, the generic drug approval. Uh, and, and as in terms of uh, PBPK, uh, it's been used uh, extensively in the new drug area. And of course, we are um, trying to implement the use of PBPK approach for generic drugs and now with the uh, young adolescents or uh, pediatric group. So this is really a uh, one step forward. Um, um, and then if, if I may, Lucy, uh, we, we've been talking about um, all those challenges and limitations and what we need to improve. And we've been talking about the, uh, in terms of like, uh, uh, the, like what type of data and how lack of data and the different formulations and how can we use and with the limited data and all. Uh, but uh, based on, uh, and I heard this from uh, one of the panel members from yesterday, how we came a long way when it comes to PPVPK uh, compared with uh, 10 years ago. And as I was um, yeah. listening to the presentations, um, from the, especially from the new drug side, what I can kind of compare this PBPK with is uh, pharmacogenomics and genetics information, as well as uh, QT prolongation and biomarker qualifications work in the new drug area. And believe it or not, uh, we had similar issues uh, back in 20 years ago when we were talking about um, safe harbor for the uh, pharmacogenomic information and how can we use that information for the drug approval. And uh, so I do want to uh, compliment you guys uh, for holding this type of workshop and uh, you, uh, trying to utilize the underrepresented populations such as uh, pa uh, pediatric in, in this uh, area. Uh, but uh, with this particular example, uh, unlike other drugs, we have extensive uh, data uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, in terms of PK and in vitro data that we have received from the FD, uh, from the um, applicants. And we, have, we were very fortunate enough to uh, be able to use this type of data to develop PBPK and then also utilize the safe space for the dissolution. Uh, so this is really, really exciting uh, one step forward. I'm here for a nice compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to share some additional thoughts? Okay, Yusuf, please. Yeah, thank you. So here talking about the generic drug development. Uh, so usually uh, we use the uh, BKB studies in adults to evaluate the BE uh, in pediatrics. But based on the uh, bioequivalence guidance for uh, pharmacokinetic endpoints, uh, usually we need to pay attention to uh, drug products used for pediatric under the age uh, of six. 
Therefore, I think that uh, BBBK modeling uh, can be used uh, to assess the bioequivalence in this age group, especially if there is a risk for extrapolating the BE results uh, from adults uh, to pediatrics. And to have a, a more confidence in the uh, in the model that uh, we developed, that there should be uh, verifications uh, for uh, the model parameters that we use in adults and that we use in adults and pediatrics, uh, followed by uh, model validation. And I think uh, for developing a model uh, to assess the uh, bioequivalence in adults and whether it could be extrapolated uh, to pediatrics. Uh, it's good to use the bio-relevant, um, uh, the solution generated in bio-relevant uh, media and to make sure that uh, this solution data in bio-relevant media is also uh, bioproductive. And based on the formulation also, uh, it is good also to determine uh, uh, which solution model that should be used to incorporate the solution data uh, in the BBBK model. And I think also, uh, as Taiko mentioned, to account for the, uh, the ontogeny, the maturation of the enzymes and the transporters that could uh, participate in the uh, absorption uh, of a drug substance and other many factors that can be uh, different between uh, adults and pediatrics, like the effect of food or pH of change, and also the fluid dynamics and the GI tract, which are highly related to the, uh, the solution and the absorption of drug substance. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with this, uh, uh, obviously. I, I think the, the, the drug chosen here, right, uh, we are somewhat fortunate because the drug is doesn't have a strong food effect and also the drug has somewhat decent solubility but imagine this if if you were to use a drug that's extensively used in um, in pediatrics in young young children uh, in the malaria space a drug like lumifantrin for example if you were to have different um, uh, uh, drug products uh, or or different dissolution profiles most likely your model would be significantly more challenged and this this brings me back to the food effect question because as far as I know, there has been no consistent scientific agreement on, for example, what is pediatric uh, fasive and feasive media? Uh, uh, what does that look like? Because the, the, the data are still not um, all there. And um, uh, just in case of, for example, lumifantrin, that is a drug has an eightfold food effect and it's formulation and dose dependent, obviously, but you can imagine um, that um, there is data in, in very young children available. And if and when um, generic uh, you know, formulation become available, it would be probably worthwhile for the FDA to look at the compound like this, in addition to what you have already done. Okay, I, uh, so sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, you were trying to cut in? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is Yu Chong uh, speaking. Can, can you hear me well? Good. Okay. Uh, I just want to comment on the uh, on the um, uh, um, uh, the demonstration of bioequivalence for generic drugs in in pediatrics. Um, as you know, the uh, bioequivalent bio study for generic drug is usually conducted in the, in the adult healthy volunteers. Uh, the reason is more is not only on on the practical issue like the difficulty in recruiting uh, uh, children for for any uh, uh, clinical studies, uh, but in terms of uh, um, um, on the issue of bioequivalence. As you know, generic products contain the same API as the brand product. So what we really try to demonstrate here is, is, is if there's any difference in formulation related uh, uh, difference in absorption of, of the drugs. Uh, so uh, unless there's, there's evidence that, that uh, uh, the absorption of the drug from, from the generic and, and the brand product will differ in pediatric, uh, there's no reason to believe that that um, uh, that data we we obtain from from adults uh, subjects 
uh, will not apply to uh, to pediatric uh, pediatric uh, subjects, and that's why we we don't usually uh, uh, do you know biocoffin study in, in in children. And and so uh, you know I I I understand the potential concern from from people that uh, that if if a generic product is demonstrated to be bioequivalent in in adult subject, uh, perhaps it may not be bioequivalent in, in in pediatric subjects. But so far, we there's no evidence that that has happened, uh, and and uh, uh, basically because uh, um, you know any difference in in absorption uh, that that is not observed in adult subjects is not likely to observe in in pediatric uh, subjects. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Now so, I, I do have a sorry. I, I one more comment. I do have a specific comment on, on the example. Um, in in the examples, uh, the especially on the um, on the determination of of the safe uh, safe space for for dissolution. Um, I noticed that the um, the application of ninety percent confidence interval for the geometric mean ratio. Was used, but I th I believe that's questionable because uh, the the ninety percent uh, confidence interval is not only affected by formulation difference in distribution rate, but also by the sample size used uh, for the simulation. Now, in, in the case given, um, the safe the, the the safe space for both adults and pediatrics would have been wider uh, if the sample sizes of fifty and twenty five subjects. Will increase in the simulation. So I, I, that's why I I believe that that um, uh, when you try to uh, uh, look at the safe space, you have to uh, um, consider the sample size. Uh, otherwise, I think you sh you should uh, uh, perhaps only look at the uh, the geometric mean ratio for the determination of of the safe space. Yes, that's right. Actually, so that's why in this uh, project we use the actually the sample size from the in vivo clinical study that we have we from which we got the uh, the observed BK data. Right. Uh, I so mean, that's that, the sample size we use. Yeah. To me, that that that's quite arbitrary. I mean, for you know, for for biocoffin study, you can always increase the sample size. Of course, that that's that's cause concern in in doing that. But for for simulation, I mean, it, it's it's easy to change the sample size. You just you just you know change the program, or, or you know uh, from say twenty five to fifty, or even to hundred, and you find that the, uh, the the safe space will be a lot wider. Yep, that's a, that's an excellent point. So maybe we can come back to this later during the discussion. Um, I wanted to switch gear a little bit towards uh, the first presentation, uh, as well as some of the questions that are coming up uh, on the chat. So I was wondering if uh, panel members uh, can comment on, um, for translational research, such as the one we are discussing today, how does one select an in vitro system uh, to predict absorption genetics or precipitation genetics? For modified release or immediate release formulations uh, with BCS204 compounds? And what's the best way to incorporate them in the model? Uh, so maybe Rodrigo, since uh, that was based on your uh, presentation, I can I can turn it to you to get us started. Oh sure, sure. It's going to be my pleasure, Philippos. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great, great. So I think this is a, a very important question. Thank you so much for that. So I think it's quite challenging, specifically if we think about the weak basis. So I think one, I, maybe the bottom line we can get from the from the modeling exercise that we did for ketoconazole is that, well, different in vitro setups may give us different results. So it's not a surprise if we go with the dumping test or the transfer model, they are closed system by nature. So basically there is only one way. If you have a super saturated solution over there, the only pathway for the supersaturated solution is to precipitate. So there is nothing else there. So it's not a surprise that sometimes we have an overestimation of the precipitation rate of the precipitation kinetics. So it seems that some uh, more advanced, if you like, 
in vitro systems like the biphasic or overall systems considering also drug removal from solution by absorption, by permeation, they may allow us to better capture what may be happening in the intestinal lumen. So specifically for ketoconazole, the biphasic dissolution gave a very reasonable input for the model. But you know, it was not there, but we did the same exercise for itraconazole and it was not the case. So uh, it, it can be a, a, a little bit complicated. So it was good for ketoconazole, but for itraconazole, it was a little bit more complicated. So in my opinion here, uh, I mean, doing some reverse translation exercises is a very good way to gain knowledge to kind of bridge some knowledge gaps that we have in the translatability of in vitro, especially in vitro precipitation data. And after we gain enough confidence on this one, maybe we can move on to the purely forward translation with much more confidence. But I mean, on a, on a, putting this on a short way, so far, it seems that by accounting for permeation and precipitation at the same time, it's a good way to get a better estimation of the precipitation rate kinetics. But again, it seems that that might be a little bit drug dependent since we got a better result for biphasic dissolution for ketoconazole, but that was not the case for itraconazole. So I think we still need to do a little bit of more research on this topic here. Thank you, Rodrigo. Maybe I can turn it over to you, Dusin. I, you know, you, you guys are doing at Mystic and a lot of work on uh, dissolution systems, so maybe you can also uh, chime in here. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're good. Yes. Okay. So, so thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I think I enjoy Rodrigo's presentation. I think he did a really excellent job to give an example for weak base and a weak acid. Uh, let me let me start with the weak acid first, then I go to weak base. Um, based on our data uh, from in vitro dissolution, in vivo dissolution from the human GI tract and also PK, we, uh, of course, all, all uh, Regico presented a correct. I think all the challenges regarding pH, buffer capacity, uh, volume, rotation speed is correct. We have a feeling for weak base, another important factor in addition to dissolution condition, also another important factor are transient, meaning especially gastric emptying. From a BE point of view, the gastric emptying may have a more dramatic effect than other factors for weak acid. That may make our life a little bit easier, my thinking. Maybe FDA can think about my, my crazy thinking in, in last year or two years. <laughs> So, it seems if you change the pH, the buffer condition, or other things, dissolution is changing for sure in stomach, in small intestine. In stomach, small intestine is different because weak acid is tend to be easily dissolved well in small intestine. Even you have a pretty big dissolution change in the human stomach, yet the effect by that change versus gastric emptying is very uh, is smaller. So gastroenteritis change much bigger for the PK profile. That's make it very harder, very harder to do a PE study in the fasting state. So because depends on when do you give the drug, start to give the dose, the MMC cycle will be different. Your gastroenteritis will be different. That's actually changed dramatically. That's make your PE harder. I have this crazy thinking: what if, what if you change the PE condition? using a glucose solution rather than fasting state, but use a, a, not a fat state, for sure not a food state, but for the energy glucose solution so that you can standardize the gas emptying as a standard testing population rather than fasting. Fasting is actually more harder. Food is, in fact is harder, but a fasting also harder. For that particular case in weak acid, whether FDA should consider use a standard glucose solution, in that way you can standardize your gastroenteritis. So the data does seem to show the gastroenteritis change more than other factors, other dissolution stomach. So that's one crazy, crazy thought I have. We can <laughs> debate about. 
uh, come to the weak base. I think Rodrigo also did a very, uh, very good job of a weak base. I think the model works for some of the drug works really well. And because the validation is from PK profile, if we don't, if the model does not fit well, we always go back to change some of the parameter, maybe get a scatting factor, which is okay for some of the drug use type of drug for B study. But, but in reality though, if we really want to build a BBPK model, we really want to know not only precipitation, but also the volume, the transient, the buffer capacity, the surfactant for small intestine. I think small intestine condition, the transient, the volume of each compartment, the, the buffer capacity, the, uh, the, the surfactant each compartment is more important for weak base, but a come to weak acid, I think we should consider more stomach and also more transient. Uh, we don't have a feeling yet for the weak base, how transient for a role. Our feeling is transient play major role in acid than weak base. I, I stop here, uh, let's ask other people to critique. Thanks, thanks, Dushin. Maybe, Barnu, can you maybe comment on your experience through Looking at the PPK model of being submitted, do you have any recommendations for the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Can you hear me well? Yep. Yep. So um, to answer the question, what's the best way? First of all, I wanted to say uh, the research conducted by um, Dr. Uh, Cristofoletti and others in the academia and their published work um shed light on this topic uh, about the super saturation and precipitation kinetics however uh, i agree with uh, uh rodrigo that we really still need to encourage the um, research in this topic to to understand further so from the regulatory hat from uh, office of new drug products and division of biopharmaceutics I cannot say this model, one model will fit all, obviously, as we already know and discussed. So from our perspective, from the regulatory hat, that we are open to all different approaches as long as uh, scientifically sound and incorporated in the um, validated um, model. So um, that will be my <laughs> um, two cents. Thank you. Um, Lucy, I know you have a question ready for the for the panel now. Yeah, so I really want to echo what uh, Yi Chong just mentioned, like for a full generic product, when they are, when the value equivalence is demonstrated in adults, we do anticipate the generics are also value equivalent in any other intended patient population. And for, I mean, pretty much that in the labeled patient population. So that same principle also is applicable applicable to pediatric population. So I, I want to make echo that comment. So and I see a couple of questions regarding the pediatric PDPK modeling and we all understand from new drug development the pediatric PDPK modeling has been used to bridge different bridge the PK of different formulations. So I, I want to direct this question to Jiang Hong. Can you comment on the key factors that those pediatric PVPK should consider for the intended purpose to bridge the PK of different formulations from based on your experience? Jiang Hong, I think you are muted. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, actually, uh, I like the word Yusuf used in his presentation, tolerance. So, I think during this two days workshop, uh, we talked a few times about the ideal drug, right? Uh, ideal drug for me means the simple drug. And uh, uh, I probably want to comment on the second question. Um, whether we are confident if we extend this strategy or, or a framework to the other drugs. For me, I probably, if we are able to find the, the simple drug, definitely we will have a high confidence. But in terms of how to find the simple drug, probably I have some uh, 
suggestion that first we need to identify the potential model limitation and the uncertainty of the model, including the idle model and also the uh, the pediatric model. For the pediatric model, we need to uh, to think about whether all the age dependent parameter have been already incorporated model or not, uh, or the those kind of parameter value whether are appropriate uh, assigned in the model or not. And the second thing, I think we need to be aware of uh, how many kind of in vitro dissolution approach available right now. What are the pros and the cons of each individual in vitro dissolution approach? And the third thing is we need to understand the, the drug product. What's the physical chemical properties? Uh, what's the log P value? What's the PKA value? Uh, what those kind of number means? What's the solubility? Whether the drug has a precipitation, super saturation, or whether the drug is stable or not in the GI tract, uh, whether the drug is the subject of cif 4 subject or the subject of the uh, transporter in the GI tract, and whether there's some special excipient included in, in the formulation that may affect the drug absorption, or whether there's some uh, special release mechanism. Uh, after we collect all the information and put together, I think sometimes we may have a rough idea that what step could be the limiting step uh, in the drug absorption? And we can go back to look at our model to see which kind of parameter actually involved in the limiting step. And if those kind of parameter are not related to the drug product uh, quality, then certainly we have our, our certain confidence level uh, in regard to the model performance. But if, if the answer is yes, those kind of parameters are directly related to the drug product quality, then we really need to be careful to, to validate our model. We may need more, more data to validate our model. And uh, uh, in order to have a model prediction, it's sensitive, but not really over sensitive to the change in the formulation variable. And uh, another thing I want to mention here, I really echo the, the other panel members' um, opinion. The, the model prediction in the pediatric population actually is very challenging, uh, not only because the model limitation, the potential model limitation, but also it's because in most of the cases, we do not have uh, enough PK data to validate the model. And uh, in, in our in new drug set, usually, uh, we rely more on the risk assessment. And um, sometimes we base the totality of the evidence to make uh, the final decision. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's all. Thank you. Excellent point, Jiangfeng. I really like the wording from your comment that the PBPK, the pediatric PBPK is more like serving as a tool for risk assessment. I, I, I like that point a lot. So I, I would also like to hear some thoughts from MJ on this. Um, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, sure, uh, just quickly on this, uh, the, when, when, uh, once again, um, the one thing that I really want to emphasize is Although we we may want to uh, be so called perfect when it comes to the the, the um, um, PBPK validation uh, for the pediatric use and all, uh, just like what Chang Hong said, we do have a very limited uh, uh, in vivo or clinical data uh, PK data in in pediatrics. So. Uh, we will get there at some point, but just uh, we have to be also mindful about uh, the amount of data that we have. Uh, and with, when it comes to data set or the limited data, data set, I'm very much looking forward to the next session, which is going to be a, a model master file and um, how to share the information. Uh, not just the model itself, uh, but at some point I would like to see some sort of a data sharing in, in so-called uh, safe space for the pediatric and underrepresented um, uh, populations. Thank you. Anything to add from Taco? I was just curious, 
uh, from FDA perspective, right? Uh, again, you're talking about generics here and you're talking about all these age groups. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you start with the uh, age group of say, like say six to 18 years old or six to 12 and 12 to 18 year old to figure out if, if, if there were a formulation change and that you could assess it in that population, because I'm still very cautious about uh, trying to go to the neonates. And uh, again, you should be congratulating for having done that for Oseltamivir, but because I think as uh, Yang Hong also mentioned, uh, you need to worry about uh, on top of the absorption, you need to worry about usually ontogeny for almost all drugs. I mean, uh, below the, the below the age of two months for sure and sometimes even below the age of two years old because uh you know zip 3 4 um, matures for most uh isozymes by the age of one but UG, some of the ugts they take even longer so that's why if i had to dissect this puzzle into smaller pieces for bioequivalence of generics i would probably start with the older age groups so actually, Teko, I want to probably turn this question to, to you in a little bit. I mean, my, my thinking is if you're talking about from 6 to 18, in my mind, they are pretty just small adults. I mean, they, are, <laughs> they can swallow the tablet, they can, they can swallow the capsule. And to me, like, it's, I, I, I feel more comfortable like extrapolating whatever to be from adults to this age group yeah I, i'm just yeah. curious like what i mean is there any particular thinking in your mind you think we should pay attention to this age group because a bigger concern i mean i mean if you talk about risk probably for this age group uh, to me the risk is somewhere i'm comfortable with you, you know what i mean Right, it comes back to what um, I think uh, Yu Chung Tsang said earlier, right? Typically, we run it in adults and we demonstrate bioequivalence and uh, there is no, no very strong cases, perhaps with the exception of the one you presented, where the um, BE limits should be significantly different for different for different age groups. But what I'm saying is, is that to 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 demonstrate your point that there could be differences. Uh, ultimately, you have to look at additional drugs, and and if you do, then uh, there's, as you know, typically exponentially more data for older children than for neonates. I think the Tamiflu uh, here is really a, a, one of the big exceptions, uh, as far as I know. Again, I, I know only of drugs in the malaria space and the tropical diseases where you get, or HIV, you know, where you get large data sets in very young children. So to me, I think this this issue is, I, I think we have to look from the totality of evidence perspective. So yeah. I, I think the way of looking at this is really you have to do your formulation comparison. How, how similar is the proposed formulation against the reference formulation? And also, you have to understand the excipients that you use in your formulation versus the reference. And then the, the biorelevant in vitro testing, I think based on all this, you are gonna narrow down the risk. I think that that's where I like to term the risk assessment. If you identify some risk, you then you probably can use the PVPK to help right. you to assess that risk factor. That's my thinking. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay, Jiang Hong, I think you no, will Hong. make a additional well, we'll comment. Yes. So, Jiang Hong, maybe you can make some final comments here. Yeah, I think uh, usually we start from the simple case to the more complicated, right? And start from adult to adolescent from 12 to 18 years old, and then from 6 to 12, and then from 2 to 6. And uh, and we can uh, figure out whether there's something. Uh, I mean, in terms of the PK, whether it change or not, and we can uh, tease out some other factor when we go to the neonate or infant, which is uh, most complicated, right? The 
we have to incorporate all the eight dependent physiological parameters in the model. So we can learn from the basic, uh, the simple cases and go to the uh, move, move, move down to the more complex cases and try to understand the drug product better. Rodrigo. Yeah, if I may chime in, this, this is a very interesting discussion here. So, I, I mean, and uh, I understand that right now we are all talking about the basic assumption behind bioequivalence. So, it, it, we are assuming here that the health following here is the best model to capture formulation differences if they exist. But just thinking about the hypothetical scenario here for pediatrics, for example, we may see it's not. Uh, I think we have a couple of cases in the literature so far where there is a shift in the in the BCS classification when moving from adults to pediatrics. So, and and that could cause a little bit of of some different behaviors over there. I, I, the only case that I remember. It was some time ago. It was not uh, the, the discussion was not uh, really based in pediatrics, but it was more like for again for ketoconazole, and only for the API uh, we got access to two APIs basically with different particle sizes. When carrying out the dissolution of the ketoconazole API in gastric in in a media simulating gastric conditions, they were kind of overlapping one on top of the other, but they behaved a little bit different when moving to a dissolution in a in more neutral medium. And uh, uh, at that time, we kind of carried out a little bit of a, an exploratory bioequivalence analysis because I mean this is one of the beauties of PBPK modeling. So you can really test whether the BE decision in healthy adults would still hold if we move to different populations. The limitation here is how how deep we understand the physiology in different populations here. This is the key element. And I remember that, that specific case for ketoconazole, it was more like, well, considering the healthy adult subject, uh, we found a bioequivalence uh, result when using those two particle sizes difference in terms of ketoconazole, but things were a little bit different in, um, let's say, a chlorhedric or hypochlorhedric scenario. And this is not unusual. This is really a case for elderly patients. So we have a high prevalence of hypochlorhydria in elderly patients. So, and I mean, we do not have the clinical trial showing that, but I think this is something that we can get with PBPK modeling. We can use this one to raise hypotheses and see what would be some critical cases. And then we can try to understand whether that is a problem or not. So I guess that the point here is that using PBPK modeling and virtual bioequivalence in this aspect, you can really kind of interrogate whether testing health adults is still uh, is, is, is enough. Probably for the most case it's going to be, but I, I guess sometimes we are going to find some tiny exceptions over there, like this case of hypochlorhydric subjects and whether maybe we may see a shift in the BCS classification when moving from adults to pediatrics, but it's just a theoretical construct. So we do not have clinical evidence supporting nothing of that. Great. So, so fortunately we're on time. This has been an excellent discussion. Thanks. Thanks to all the panel members. Thanks to the presenters for both the presentations and participating in the discussion today. There's a lot of very interesting questions on the, on the chat uh, around also uh, locally acting oral drugs, low availability drugs. We will try to export these questions uh, and uh, see if there is any way for us to uh, to follow up on this. Uh, but I would like to again thank everyone uh, for attending this section. Uh, hopefully, you found it informative. And again, thanks to our uh, presenters and panelists for the for the excellent discussion. Thanks, Filippo. Thanks, Lucy. It is uh, we'll, we'll take a 10-minute tea break. We'll resume at 2:40 p.m. Eastern time. We're in the home stretch, uh, but the best is still to come. Session four, model acceptance and model sharing for regulatory use. See you in 10 minutes.